Hello, I'm Ron Carr. Today, I want to talk about this book, Key to the True Kabbalah. And I want to dedicate this video to my friend J.M., who has been asking me repeatedly when I'm going to say anything more about Key to the True Kabbalah, which I haven't done for about 23 years since I wrote my initial commentary in the year 2000. So, <clears throat> saying something about KTQ is rather involved. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> this is an amazing book. What Barden did with KTQ was present something that appears nowhere else in the literature. It's hinted at here and there in the Sefer Yetzirah. It's hinted at probably the strongest uh, of all the writings. If you read the Sefer Yetzirah as a directive, as Arya Kaplan translated it at one point, it's instructions. It's not just a description. It's an instruction. Um, <clears throat> for me, it is very important and, and very sacred in the sense of very significant. Um, so, that's the angle from which I approach KTQ. Other people approach it in other ways. Um, <clears throat> but that, to me, is not really KTQ. KTQ is a life's work. It is not something that one does in a week or a day or a month or even a year. Uh, it can take decades to truly master KTQ. But in f fairly quick order, one can make significant progress in KTQ because it is rooted in all of the things you learned in initiation into hermetics. And this is why Barton insisted that it is only someone who has completed step eight of initiation into hermetics is a suitable candidate to begin working with KTQ. And this proves out in the work. So the exercises in KTQ are all rooted in the work you did in initiation into hermetics. So it's really very easy to accomplish, okay? It just takes time. Um, now, first I want to talk about uh, the book from a technical standpoint. The book is based on the Sefer Yetzirah. This is where Barden draws the majority of the material for the correspondences to the letters in the KTQ. Now, <clears throat> I present uh, this little chart here. It's on the screen now. Um, <clears throat> that outlines the contents of the exercises in KTQ. Now, the KTQ itself is basically, has basically three sections to it. First is the theory, then is, are the exercises one does to master the alphabet? And the third part is the keys themselves. This, the first key with the single letters, the double letters, triple letters, and quadruple letters, okay? So that part is about actually speaking Kabbalistically. The second part teaches you all you need to know to be able to speak Kabbalistically. So, <clears throat> Barden presents uh, a list, an alphabet composed of 27 letters. This relates directly to the Hebrew, which has 22 letters, consonants, that are spoken, plus five vowel points that enable one to speak those consonants. 
because the in Hebrew the consonants cannot be spoken unless there is a vowel point associated with them. It, they, the vowel points are the breath of the spoken alphabet. So 22 letters and five vowel points, Barden translates into this 27 letter alphabet. Now, it's really important to note that Barden was writing in German, basically, when he wrote KTQ. So his alphabet is a Germanic alphabet. It's not an American English alphabet. It, the letters are pronounced differently. For example, Barden lists F, but he doesn't list V. He says V is essentially an F sound. <clears throat> now in Hebrew, there is a V, but there is no F, okay? So in Barden's alphabet, he has F instead of V. Now in German, the V is pronounced as an F. And likewise, the W is pronounced as a V. It gets confusing, okay? So in this list I have given you, I've made those associations. Under F is listed as the Hebrew equivalent of Vav, okay? So you've got to take that in consideration when you are pronouncing the letters of Barden's alphabet. There's specifically Unats, <laughs> which we don't have in English, but which are a very European part of speaking. So you got to learn how to speak those umlauts. And if you don't know already, uh, I'm sure many of you already do. Um, but for those Americans who are watching this video, these are important issues. The pronunciation of these letters is not going to be an American English pronunciation. That's all there is to it. So you've got to investigate that and learn the, both the Hebrew pronunciation, because that plays a big part in things here, the, the way that these letters relate to each other, um, is rooted in the Hebrew pronunciation of the letters in most cases. And you've got to understand the Germanic pronunciation of the letters. Okay. Um, <clears throat> specifically, the VF, the C. Now, <clears throat> Germanic C is more like a TZ. It's more like Z than it is S. Um, so, in this case, it relates to the Hebrew tzadi, because there is no C in Hebrew. There is Samek, which has the same sound as an English C, um, and there is the Kaf, which has the same sound as K, K which in English, C often does as well. Languages are a very confusing thing. Now, uh, there, uh, there, is, there are two letters in Barden's alphabet, the J and the W, which uh, don't have logical, really, um, uh, 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 Hebrew equivalents. Um, for example, it, I have assigned the letter Kuf to the Barden's letter W. Now, Kuf in Hebrew is different from Kaf. They're similar sounds, both the, the hard, harsh K, K sound, 
but there are subtle differences between the two. Um, in Barden's alphabet, there is no Q, which we, Kuf, we use Q to symbolize the letter Kuf in English. Um, so I have assigned it to the W in uh, Barden's alphabet. And I've gotten to that conclusion by the, um, <clears throat> by specifically the elemental region, water, and the anatomy, both of which, well, the anatomy list comes directly from the Sefer Yetzirah relating to the Hebrew letters that I've defined uh, that relate to Barden's letters. This does get confusing, okay? <clears throat> so, Kuf, the symbolism for the letter Kuf belongs to Barden's letter W. And now we come to the J. For the J in Germanic is not like the English J. It's more like the Spanish J. Juan, J-U-N. It has a almost a W sound to it. A uh, sound to it. <clears throat> in the Germanic. But there is no J in Hebrew. That's the Yod. Okay? So often, the, the Yod, which here correctly Barden has associated with the I um, <clears throat> is often written at, with a J in Germanic uh, language and in this in KTQ there is a relationship between the I and the J that Barden sort of struggles with a little bit it's interesting but the J Barden's J has the symbol set of the Tav, the Hebrew Tav. So this is what I've noted in the list here. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Barden also uses vowel points. Well, excuse me, uses vowels that do not appear in Hebrew other than as vowel points. And in this Barden's alphabet, they are, for the most part, the umlauts, okay? Umlaut U, umlaut O, umlaut A, with two exceptions. The E, which is a vowel, which does not appear in the Hebrew alphabet, and is only a vowel point, um, <clears throat> and the U, which similarly does not appear in the Hebrew alphabet, but is a vowel point. So these five vowels correspond to the vowel points in Hebrew, and that that is significant because three of those vowel points, well, all of the vowel points, all of these vowels in Barden's alphabet relate to the Akasha. Three of them relate to the Akasha plus earth and two of them to just the pure Akasha. Okay. So, a lot of analysis has gone into this chart and it has basically been analysis of the Sefer Yetzirah and the analysis of the text of KTQ. The uh, elemental regions for the 12 zodiacal letters in Hebrew are exactly what Barden uh, uh, listed. So there is direct correlation here. And the mother letters, the three mother letters, correspond directly. In fact, Barton mentions that in the text of KTQ, that these are the mother letters of these elements, therefore 
you know, they relate to this element. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> a final thing about the technical thing and the research into KTQ is that <clears throat> there is no objective relationship between these letter sounds, and it is all about uh, letter sounds, because we're speaking the letters, we're uttering the letters. Um, <clears throat> there is no objective relationship between the letter sounds and the symbol set that Barton uses or that the Sephiroth Zira uses. This is a human construct. It's all based on our human interpretation and there is no consistency in the symbol sets between different authorities. The Sefer Yetzirah has so many versions of attributes to the letters. It's really entertaining. But the important thing is that if you use these particular symbol sets in association with these particular human sounds, and there are a whole lot more human vocalizations possible than just these 27, but using these 27 vocalizations plus these particular symbol sets will result in what Barden describes. And that's the point, okay? It's very much like the chakras. The chakras are not descriptive. They're not describing an objective reality. What they are is prescriptive. They are saying, okay, you visualize, you work, with this set of chakras in your body, in this way, you will have this result. But, likewise, there's all sorts of different uh, uh, traditions of the chakras that result in different outcomes, okay? So, whether or not there is an objective relationship is irrelevant because we are subjective human beings doing this, okay? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> my book, The Book of Aries, which is very closely related to Key to the True Kabbalah, it is the Kabbalah of essential meaning versus Barden's Kabbalah of letters, okay? So, the book of Aries deals more with the objective universe and the direct perception of that objective universe than KTQ does, okay? Which is part of the reason why I'm talking about this now. Okay, okay now, <clears throat> I have some issues, or there are some issues, with the text of KTQ. And I use the Rugeberg edition. I've never even looked through the um, Merker edition, so I don't know if they've massacred it or not. Um, so, I'm going by the Rugeberg edition, the original English edition of KTQ. There are some glaring errors or issues with the text in KTQ. Very first is the sequence of the letters he works with in the very first section uh, where you're dealing with learning the colors of the letters. Step one, the color of each letter. The sequence of letters he uses here is sort of unique because all of the other sections 
the elemental regions, the anatomy, the tone, and the element feeling use a different sequence of letters. I mean, you pursue the letters in a di different sequence. So what I have done in my list is rectified that so that they're all listed in the later sequence, not this initial sequence that he has, which is sort of odd, okay? That sequence, that initial sequence, does appear later in the single key when you're working with the single letter, the first key. But that's so different and it's it's a different kind of working that you are doing that it doesn't matter here in the learning part where you're learning how to speak the letters i think it's important to maintain the <clears throat> same sequence because <clears throat> this work changes you uh, it, it transforms you all three of your bodies are transformed by doing this work. So having a consistency in the sequence makes sense. So I have provided the sequence of letters in the predominant sequence of the book. The second issue is the uh, step two elemental regions. The list Barden gives in the book is absolute crap. It is not accurate. There are some instances where it's accurate, but the, in general, that list of elemental correspondences to the letters is disproven by every other symbol set. It does not even follow the Sefer Yetzirah. However, the water pole, the element of feeling, does give the exactly um, the Sefer Yetzira relationships with the elements. So, <clears throat> the list that Barden provides, you know, this section on the element regions, you have to just discard. You will find if you start working as what I, this is what <clears throat> clued me into it originally, was I started working with this uh, relationship to the elements, and it, it didn't work. I mean, I couldn't make the accumulation in this region of my body. <clears throat> and I had to step back and say, whoa, what's going on? And that's when I, I discovered this fact that that whole element region is crap. Now, why? Why would Barden write this section so incorrectly? And my theory is that it was intentional, that he was testing to see if you're paying attention, testing to see if you really are the right person to be doing this work. Because if you get to this point and you start, you know, trying his uh, uh, element um, assignments and you find that it isn't working, you've got to be able to recognize that, admit that, and figure out why it's not working. You have to be able to do that. So, I'm relieving you of that burden, basically, by providing the correct list here of element regions for each letter, okay? Now, the third one, third issue, has to do with the umlaut A, which is the letter point comments. Now, he lists this <clears throat> as he lists this later as being just earth, the element um, in the section on the element feeling, he lists this as being just earth. And that's incorrect. It is a vowel point, the umlaut A, and all of the vowel points 
relate to the Akasha as well. However, in step four, um, <clears throat> this is rectified um, in comments that he makes about the uh, umlaut A being both Akasha and Earth. So, in the list that I provide, that's been corrected again. It is Akasha and Earth. And that proves true in working with the umlaut A in its loamy brown color. Um, <clears throat> now, there is... In the Rugeberg edition, and I don't know if this carries over to the Merker edition, I imagine it does, um, there is mention in the water pole, the element feeling, that the R is missing in the man original manuscript, and there are in the manuscript, and there is no original manuscript to correct it from. Well, I mean, big deal. It's rectified in step four, the um, elemental, the earth pole, basically, the elemental uh, feeling and the work with the elemental regions are, is definitely the earth. So, all the errors rectify themselves in the text if you really study the whole text. Okay, and compare and write down. <clears throat> now, the anatomy is, like I said, directly from uh, Sefer Yetzirah. The only variants in that are the vowel points. The vowel points are not given any anatomical uh, correlation in the Sefer Yetzirah. In fact, the vowel points are not really considered in the Sefer Yetzirah, directly at any rate. But he assigns things, uh, anatomy, to the vowel points that does not appear in the Sefer Yetzirah. Like he's not reproducing an anatomical part, body part, that was assigned somewhere else in the Sefer Yetzirah. Okay. Um, the tones, who knows where they come from? They don't, well, I haven't found anywhere that tones are related to the letters. Tones are related to the vowel points in Hebrew. This is how a cantor can cant, you know, certain passages it's all done with the vowel points being a tonal instruction, um, but there, there are no vowels, I mean, no tones associated with the Hebrew letters that I have found anywhere. So to me, these seem fairly arbitrary. However, Barden says that when it comes to the air pole and developing the tones, the colors are rectified to the tone. So, and that, that's definitely what happens when it comes to the tone. Once you have the pure tone, the color sort of may sort of uh, improve itself. Okay? And that's, and that's one thing about this work. It is subjective. Uh, Barden says in there, don't worry about being exactly in tune because the tone is your making of the tone and it will depend upon your maturity. Same thing with the colors. You know, what is light blue? You know, I might see light blue as being something different than you see light blue and everybody will have their own version of light blue and that's true for all of the colors. But that's the point. It depends upon your maturity, as Barden puts it, upon your maturity as to what grade of color you're going to be working with. 
and it may change over time depending on your own maturity. So that's the basic <coughs> comments on the text itself, on the, uh, the, the nature of the text itself. Okay, so enough of all that. Now we come to the, the work of KTQ itself. Uh, well, really, the book itself, because it starts out before we get to work um, with the introduction, the theory portion. Um, it's it probably won't tell you anything you don't already know, but the thing that's important about the introduction. Uh, about the theory section and the uh, little uh, segment on preconditions right before you begin working um, <clears throat> is it describes in there amongst all the things he says the person that you need to be in order to be successful with uh, um, KTQ. Um, <clears throat> he describes the achievements that you must have achieved <clears throat> already. You must be able to really understand what Barden is saying here about the quality of person that is appropriate for KTQ. You must recognize that person inside of yourself. That is the important part of the introductory material. Okay? So, Let's get down to the work of KTQ. Okay, step one pertains to color. Now, this is the fire pole. So, what we are learning here is a quadrupolar speech where we have a fire pole, which is the color, it's visual color, the air pole which is the auditory, the tone, the sound, the water pole, which is the feeling of each of the elemental uh, quadrants, the elemental feeling that associates with each letter, and then the earth pole, which is combining the three together and actually speaking the word, the letters, okay? So step one is just the fire pole, just working with color. And in this step, he lays out the basic working method. Okay, first thing you have to think about is that you are going to be speaking these letters in your mind only. Now, <clears throat> in one of the charts I'm providing, having to do with the Sefer Yatsira, at the bottom, I divide the letters into five groups based on where in the mouth the Hebrew letters are pronounced. There are the dentals, the z, s, sh, r, tz, the palatals, the g, the i, the k, the kuf, the gutturals, the, oh, oh. the linguals, the D, T, L, N, th. and the labials, the B, V, M, P. So this is d d discerning between the different letters and where in the mouth they are spoken, which is very important in Hebrew doesn't matter one bit in English. 
but in Hebrew it does. And that, that will be your guide in pronouncing the letters mentally, okay? Because mentally, you can pronounce the b, 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 b of B without it being B, ba, bi, bo, boo. You know, without requiring the vowel to pronounce the B. So you can just do the b, 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 b sound, you know, continuously in your mind, whereas you can't with your mouth and speaking it, okay? So, in this particular spot in the book, you will really focus on how you are speaking these letters because it does uh, pertain to the symbolism of the letters, how they are spoken. And this comes from the Hebrew root of the KTQ. <clears throat> okay, so you're speaking the letter in your mind. We'll just start with the Aleph. We'll just deal with the Aleph here. You're speaking the, the Ah uh, in your mind, you know, and you are creating <clears throat> this light blue color fills your room. <clears throat> okay, that's where you start. You're filling your room with the light blue color. Now, this is not difficult for you to do. You did this with the vital energy, with the elements, with the uh, fluids, etc. in initiation to hermetics. So this is, again, very simple work for you to accomplish. So you begin by filling the room with the light blue and then you expand it so that the whole universe is filled with the light blue. <clears throat> okay, that's the very first step. Fill the room and fill the universe. So you're beginning to manipulate and generate these colored lights, okay? Then it's about your body, your whole body as a, this hollow, you stand inside of the hollow of your whole body and you generate the blue light inside of your body. Okay, again, you've done this with the vital energy, the elements, the fluids, etc. So this is no problem. Generating that blue light, you visualize the blue light filling your whole body. And then you externalize it. You don't want to have it in your body, you know, eternally. You want to rid it, your body of the blue light when you're done with it, okay? Because you, you want to hold on to these accumulations for, you know, a little bit of time while you your body acclimates. So you then release the blue light into the universe when you're done with it. So you start with the blue light in here and you externalize it, okay? Next, you're going to visually the, see the universe filled with the blue light by pronouncing the, uh, the A. The universe is filled with blue light and then you draw the blue light into your body, into the hollow body, okay? So you're bringing the light into yourself this time, holding on to it for a bit, and then, of course, letting it go. Then, to end all this, what you do is you want to create external shapes with the blue light. First, you have the blue light in your body. You know, it doesn't matter which way you've gotten it there, either just rising from within or drawing it in from the, the universe. Then you want to project the blue light into a shape, external shape. It doesn't matter what shape, whatever. But again, you've done this with the vital energy, the, the elements, the fluids already in initiation in hermetics, so it's no great feat. So you project 
this um, thing, this uh, blue light externally. Then you want to take it directly from the universe into your blue, pale blue shape. Okay? So externalize it from yourself and then, you know, draw it from the universe. You have these two ways of creating this shape. Okay? That's the basic working method for all of the other exercises you're going to come across. We start with the... We fill the room, then the universe, then we fill our body and externalize it, or we take it, we fill our body from the universe, the inductive and deductive methods, as Barton calls them, <clears throat> and then we externalize and manipulate the externalized uh, blue light. Okay? <clears throat> so, that's the first thing we do, just the whole body, dealing with the whole body and the colored light. Then, we're going to deal with the elemental regions. And remember, it's the modified list of elemental regions that I provide here. <clears throat> and we fill the region of the body that is associated with the letter in with the A, it's the air region. So we're filling our lungs and we do it inductively and deductively as well. We generate it within our lungs and we or within our chest rather and then we exhale it and then there we also draw it from the universe into our chest. So we learn both methods to have that blue light in the elemental region associated with the letter. Okay? And then finally in our dealings with the light we're going to focus the blue light in the organ associated with the A. And the organ, of course, happens to be the lungs. So we're doing it inductive and deductive again into our lungs. We're generating it in the lungs and then externalizing it or drawing it from the universe and filling our lungs. Just the lungs in the chest. So every letter is associated with an organ or body part. <clears throat> and again, this is very easy. You've done the same thing with the vital energy, the elements and the fluids already. So it's nothing new in terms of a technique. So <clears throat> now, this work with the colors will change you. It's uh, perhaps a very subtle change, hardly noticeable mostly mental, you know, um, <clears throat> very subtle, but it does significantly change you in the same way that initiation into hermetics changed you. It changed you mentally, astrally, and physically. The KTQ work is going to do the same thing. Some of the transformations will be much stronger um, than perhaps you expect. Um, it all depends on you. <laughs> okay, step two is the air pole. The sound. Each letter is assigned a tone, a, you know, a tone from the scale A through G, except there is no E in this list. And <clears throat> letters share certain tones. A certain letters share certain tones. Like the G for A is also shared by the the I, the Yod, uh, <clears throat> and the Z, the Zayin. Um, so, what we do is, now, when I came to this, I had absolutely no uh, musical understanding. Uh, I couldn't tell you what tone was what, but the internet has helped incredibly with that. And, uh, uh, you can easily download uh, audio files of the different tones, or if you have musical talent, you can play the tone, or if you know the tone. So, at any rate, 
if you're unfamiliar with the tones, familiarize yourself with the tone. I have a recording of the tone, play that, then I match it, etc. No problem. So, <clears throat> again, you're speaking only in your mind. So the whole thing with the tone occurs in your mind, okay? For now. And <clears throat> we do the work with the, the color and tone combined. We do it again in the whole body, inductively and deductively, combining the tone G and uh, the light blue color, okay? So that is created in the whole body, combining the tone and the color. So this is a bipolar utterance, if you will, of uh, the letters. Um, <clears throat> do it in the whole body, then we do it in the regions of the body, and then we do it in the organs. Yeah, inductively and deductively. Now, Barton says that the colors harmonize to the sound. So, again, these are both subjective things. Your color is subjective and your tone is subjective. It's how close you are able to match that tone depends upon your maturity. And so, the color will perhaps change ever so slightly when you introduce tone. It sort of purifies the color a bit with the tonal vibration, okay? The next one, step three, is the water pole. And it has to do with the feeling of each of the elements assigned to the letter, okay? Now, this isn't the element regions. This is... <clears throat> this is... <sighs> The whole body, what element is assigned to the letter, okay? Because when you add the feeling of the uh, letter, so with the fire, it's the, the feeling of heat, warmth. With the air, it's the feeling of ease. With the water, it's the feeling of chill. And with the earth, it's the feeling of gravity, of weight. So, this is, again, nothing new. <laughs> you encountered all of this in initiation into hermetics when you were working with the elements. So, every letter is assigned to an element, and these d relate directly to the Sephiroth serum. Um, just directly to the Sephiroth serum. Um, <clears throat> so, you invoke the <clears throat> color... <clears throat> tone and feeling first this time in your body you know you're inside the hollow of your body you utter the A at the specific tone the blue light the pale blue light arises instantly and you feel the sense of ease and that is in your whole body. And you have to do that enough so that anytime you speak the A Kabbalistically, the sense of ease arises. You don't have to think of the sense of ease in association with the A. It's just automatically a product of uttering the A, the blue light, and the proper tone, okay? Do it in your body first, and then you expand that into your workroom, so that any time you utter the A in your workroom is the feeling of ease, and then the universe, to where any time you utter the A, the universe is filled with the feeling of ease. Okay, this is what you need to do in these exercises 
with the, um, the feelings, the water pole. Now, <clears throat> when you're speaking the letter and you're working with just your body, you speak it only in your mind, okay? Now, in the tripolar speaking, when you're speaking it into your workroom, you need to vocalize slightly in sort of a whisper, a low voice, okay? And then when it's out in the universe, you also speak, you also vocalize, perhaps a little more strongly than when it is just in your room, okay? So externally, you're vocalizing. Internally, it's up all just in your head, okay? Step four is the earth pole, basically. And in this time, what you're doing is you're combining these three poles, the color, the tone, the feeling, and you're uttering it vocally as well. And you are combining them. You are <clears throat> emoting <laughs> and uh, developing your passion with each uh, speaking of the letters. Um, <clears throat> now, you also need to uh, the uh, in initiation in hermetics step six I believe it was um, you encounter the tripolar action where you are a mental body inside of an astral body acting through a physical body this is what you need to, uh, <clears throat> the mode of awareness that you need to work in, in this step, okay? You need to have that tripolar awareness as you speak quadrupolarly. It's that awareness along with these three types of, three ways, three poles of speaking the letters that result in the earth pole. It's coming together of it all. Now, what you do in beginning work here is to, again, go through the letters in the whole body, but speaking them in this tripolar way and, uh, you know, really bringing everything together. Speak them in the alphabetic order. Okay. Then we are going to speak them into the the elemental zone of each letter. Now, <clears throat> at the bottom of this chart that I've given you, I list the letters and their regions. There are actually uh, seven regions, if you will, that we're going to be speaking the letters into. We take all the letters that are associated with the fire element and we speak them into our fire, you know, the fire region of our body, into our heads. But we do them in a specific sequence that Barton lays out, which is not the analphabetic sequence. It is a specific sequence that will create a specific set of changes in you in a well-designed pattern, okay? So, we go through, and one at a time, we speak the letters into the fire region, okay? Then, this is optional, and it's not really listed in, in, uh, in KTQ, but what I recommend doing 
is speaking them all simultaneously within the region. It will, you speak them in sequence, but you hold on to what you have spoken in the fire region so that you have all of the letters active in the fire region simultaneously. Then you go to the air region, and again it's a specific sequence, and you speak them into the air region, the chest, then the water region, then the earth region. By the time you get to there, you will have created a lot of changes. Now, the, the C is bi-regional. It's the fire and air region. So that is a special circumstance here. Um, you have to speak it into these two regions simultaneously. They become one region, basically. Then we have the Akasha region. Here. You breathe them, these letters into the Akasha region. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have the Akasha and Earth regions. Three letters that are spoken into these regions. And you have to, by now, be able to combine these regions, have enough experience in speaking into these, the Akasha and Earth combination, that you can combine them so that it is an Akashic Earth that you are speaking the letters into. So once you've gone through all the letters in this way, I recommend, and Barden doesn't, you know, speak of this in KTQ, but I recommend experimenting at least with having all the letters present in each of their in their regions of your body so all the fire letters are present within the fire region all the air letters are present within the air region the water region etc the akasha region so that you have the whole alphabet in your body in this way and that will be the final transformation needed to be able to start working with uh, actual Kabbalistic utterance. Th this is basically Kabbalistic utterance, but uh, in the uh, working with the single key, etc., is a little different than just this. Okay, so. <clears throat> Then we go on to step five. Now, this is about the ten keys, the basically the ten saffron. Now, this is basically the symbolism that he's presenting, without really calling it the saffron. Um, this ten numbers, okay. Now. By the ten numbers, we mean one through ten, not zero through nine, okay? Or zero through ten. It's one through ten, the ten numbers. Um, <clears throat> this, he's basically saying you have to comprehend these ten components of the universe, of existence, um, to such a degree that you can recognize them in everything, every circumstance, every thought, every idea, etc. In order to be able to speak Kabbalistically, because these ten, the Sephirot, are the context in which the letters exist and are creative. It's within the universe <laughs> that the letters exist. The letters compose the universe. So we must understand the universe, the legality as he describes it, uh, to such a degree that we can 
confidently work within it and work with it. Um, hmm. How to put it? Um, the key to this, ultimately, uh, it can a key can be the essential meaning and the direct perception of essential meaning, because what we are perceiving is essentially this set of components. We can we can define what we are perceiving when we perceive when we directly perceive essential meaning by this set of symbols. Uh, we can assign what we perceive to these symbols, these ten components, um, these ten basic components of existence. So, um, now is not, like, not the time, you know, to be suddenly have this uh, uh, um, dropped in your lap uh, because if you haven't been pursuing that already sort of throughout your life, uh, throughout your work with initiation and dermetics at the very least, because it's that work that reveals the universe to you to the extent that you can perceive these unique individual aspects of the universe, then you have a whole lot of work to do all of a sudden, basically. Um, so what I'm saying is, you know, begin that part of the work uh, years ago. <laughs> um, and if you haven't already, it's hard to conceive of not, you know, having some uh, intellectual grasp of what he is speaking of here, sufficient to work with, having gone through initiation into hermetics. Okay. So what he's saying here is that you've got to have this framework in which you utter the letters. And this leads into the work with uh, Kabbalistic, true Kabbalistic speech, which I'm not going to cover here because it's totally irrelevant. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> by this point, you, you, you know uh, you don't need me telling you anything. Probably haven't needed me telling you anything <laughs> anyhow. So, <clears throat> So that is what I have to say in this moment about KTQ, and I will uh, I will link to a, a, a file that contains uh, a bunch of yummy stuff for KTQ. Okay, that's it. Bye bye.